the word freedom perhaps is uh, too vague a term uh, in this sort of context. I think what we have to ask <coughs> is what sort of a, of a social mm, pattern and what sort of a political regime is best calculated to help the individuals within the society and to realize the maximum extent of their desirable potentialities. I mean, it's quite obvious uh, that most of us are functioning at about 10% of capacity. And that wouldn't it be nice if we could function at 20%? As a matter of fact, I've just uh, finished a, a, a kind of utopian fantasy, which is the opposite of Brave New World, which is about a society in which a serious effort is made to help its members to realize their desirable potentialities. And I've gone into, I mean, this is an attempt to write what may be called a practical utopia. To, nothing is easier, of course, than to... Uh, to enunciate ideals and to say, well, wouldn't it be nice if everybody were good and kind and loving, etc., etc.? Of course it would be very nice, but uh, the point is, uh, how do you implement these ideals? How do you fulfill your good social and uh, psychological intentions? And when you come down to this problem, you see it's a very complex problem of organizing family life, organizing education, organizing sexual life, organizing social and economic life. I mean, there are endless factors involved in this. And to try to work out what all these factors should be is a, I must say, I found a, a very interesting job. As well as the recent Reese Reese utopia novel, Violent, had become a virtual scripture for me. And even so, I was quite unprepared when I opened my door to discover a man who looked like one of William Blake's archangels or perhaps the average man from the distant but optimal future. Very tall, very beautiful. With eyes misted over by mere blindness, he seemed to be gazing into other worlds. He had the most sensitive face I have ever seen. And when we sat down to talk, the most sensitive mind as well. And what a voice, those bell-like tones, that modulation, but that extraordinary richness of sound. His words wrapped around your mind. He was also courteous to a fault. Someone had given me a six-foot panda for Christmas, which I had propped up in a chair in the living room. Because his vision was so poor, and because he was so courteous, Aldous Huxley would address remarks to me and then to the panda. In as much as it uh, permits under suitable research conditions, the exploration of the stranger and odder areas of the human mind. I mean, this is one of the things which uh, has emerged, I think, in recent years. Not only is the material universe incomparably larger and stranger than we o used to give it any credit for, but the mental universe is also uh, larger and stranger than we give it credit for, that we carry about inside our skulls uh, an extraordinary world, a visionary world, a mystical world, uh, and that uh, the interesting fact about these uh, substances is that they open a door and permit us without doing any harm to ourselves, because this is the most extraordinary fact about these new drugs, uh, without doing physiological harm, to explore this world. From a sociological point of view, obviously these drugs can't be used. But at the same time, I mean, I, I think sooner or later, we shall have to find some kind of substitute for the permitted drug, which is alcohol. Well, I would call it a, a kind of uh, attempt to understand things. I mean, this is what I feel about myself. I mean, I, I've tried to learn all through my life as much as possible, and I've sort of tried to jot down what I feel I've le learned, and I think consequently there se may seem to be a number of inconsistencies in what I've written, but uh, this, I hope, is due to the fact that I've begun to learn new things and been able to look at things in a different way, and if the work has any value, it represents uh, the record of a long learning process. Looking at flowers in the psychedelic state, in his two books of reflections on the masculine experiences, we see how his experience of three ordinary flowers flung open the doors of his already stupendous perceptions into the very heart of the universe. He asked me to read to him the relevant passage from the Doors of Perception. I, I brought the much marked book from my shelves and I read something of the following uh, where he wrote, I was seeing what Adam had seen on the morning of his creation. 
the miracle moment by moment of naked existence. It was a bunch of flowers shining with their own inner light and all but quivering under the pressure of the significance with which they were charged. A transient that was yet eternal life. A perpetual perishing that was at the same time pure being, a bundle of minute, unique particulars in which, by some unspeakable and yet self-evident paradox, was to be seen the divine source of all existence. Huxley followed my words with his blind eyes as if he were back in that experience of pure being he indicated I should go on. A, a repeated flow from beauty to heightened beauty, from deeper to ever deeper meaning. Words like grace and transfiguration came to my mind, and this, of course, was what, among other things, they stood for. The beatific vision, sat chit ananda, being, awareness, bliss. For the first time, I understood. But uh, these particular things, I think, could be used in an extremely valuable way. I mean, as they stand, they are not uh, for general use because they, they just uh, throw people out for too long a time, but uh, they, they, they are, they, they are capable of, of enlarging people's minds and of making them discover who and what they are. I mean, they are real tools for helping to obey the Socratic injunction, know thyself. You've been called a salesman for mescaline. But this is a very strange uh, drug, of course. The, the, the peyote is this cactus which grows in northern Mexico and Texas and, and uh, has been used from time immemorial by the Indians of the Southwest. And incidentally, it's come up into Canada now, the, the use of it. It's become a kind of symbol of cultural nationalism among the Indians. And there's even a, a Christian uh, version of the peyote religion called the Native American Church, which is spreading up north. And it's, uh, it's undoubtedly a very interesting and, and strange and important drug. And of course, what they've done now, they synthesized it, and they have now another drug, lysergic acid, which produces almost identical effects, and produces in most people this uh, transfiguration of the outer world, that everything seems more real and intense and beautiful. And with people who are good visualizers, it produces visionary experiences with the eyes closed. And then it also, I mean, the Indians seem to take it for two reasons, partly to get into this visionary world, and partly to get this sense of solidarity with the other members of the, of the religion. A compatriot of his, who I think spoke to Aldous when he wrote the words, this is Christopher Fry. The human heart can go to the lengths of God. If you don't like God, substitute emerging evolutionary process. <laughs> the human heart can go to the lengths of God, dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries cracks, breaks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flood, the flow, the upstart spring. <laughs> Thank God, our time is now. Hmm? When wrong comes up to meet us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul folk ever took. Affairs are now soul-sized. The enterprise is exploration into God. What are you making for? Hmm? It takes so many thousand years to wake. But will you wake? For pity's sake, Aldous Huxley woke up. We must do the same. Thank you.